Good afternoon. Thank you, everybody's attention. We're going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. My uh, apologies for being a few minutes late. We're going to get this thing, uh, get this thing rolling now. Uh, welcome to the NFP Task Force. I think we'll start with a roll call, please. Mr. Breckis? Here. Dr. Cordville has a proxy. Ms. Britt? Here. Mr. Davis? Here. Ms. DeSell? Not here. Mr. Call? Here. Mr. Garvey? Here. Representative Landry has a proxy. Uh, Mr. Mattis? Here. Dr. Leche? Here. Ms. McReynolds has a proxy. Mr. Fleming? Here. Ms. Moe? Here. Mr. Mil Milan? Here. Senator Morris? Here. Ms. Nealon? Here. Ms. Posey? Here. Dr. Procopio? Here. Mr. Reshaw? Here. Ms. Romer? Here. Ms. Rushing? Ms. Shum? Here. Ms. Smith? Here. Mr. Sanji? Here. Dr. Thomas? Here. Ms. Boshe? Here. Superintendent White? Here. Dr. Baker? Mr. Bouchal? Here. Dr. Michelle? Here. Ms. Whitney, here. Thank you. Uh, real fast, we have a couple of folks who were not able to make it to the last meeting. Additions to the uh, group, I have uh, Charles Boudreaux and Catherine Whitney Hill. I would introduce yourself for a fast and quick background. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm Charles Boudreaux. I'm the executive director of the Louisiana School Employees Retirement System. <coughs> and Doris and I were talking about. <laughs> 18, 18 years ago, we served on the NFP Commission for about three years. I never thought I'd be sitting on another meeting. Charlie was one of the original members of, of the MFP uh, Commission and represented superintendents at that point. Uh, he used to be superintendent of Iberville Parish. So we'll go way back. Good deal. Glad to have you with us today. Whitney. Good afternoon. I'm Catherine Whitney. I'm an executive liaison officer with TRSL. I do not have the historical perspective that Mr. Bougeau would have. I'm happy to be here by trade and attorney, um, but do a variety of things at TRSL now. Former Bessie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, quick housekeeping. Make sure your green light's on your mic before you speak. Uh, when you're not speaking, you might turn it off so we're not hearing the phones vibrate and ding and whispers and all that good stuff. Appreciate that. Uh, I think if we're going to get started, I believe we have a presentation from the department. We do, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And uh, I will jump in and do a presentation and uh, certainly look forward to the committee's uh, task force's reaction to, to what I am what I, uh, presenting. I'll tell you that this presentation is pretty direct uh, in that uh, given a lot of uncertainty right now, uh, Mr. Mathis, a lot of uncertainty, uh, as you well know, uh, Think about those senators who are, have to deal with the uncertainty, a lot of financial uncertainty. And so uh, at the risk of kind of trying to sift through all that, there really is so much we don't know about the budget yet, uh, about the governor's budget, and about uh, all of the circumstances surrounding the budget. We instead just looked at where are there places in the formula right now that we discussed at the last meeting where there are where there is evidence of rising obligations, and thus that creates a scenario for options to make changes within the formula. And so that's really what you're going to see is where are there elements within the formula where the cost obligations, there's evidence that they are increasing, and therefore there are options within this formula that could be considered by anybody uh, uh, making adjustments to it. The governor's budget comes out in February, the Bessie Board meets to pass a formula in March, and then ultimately any time between April and June, it can play the proverbial ping pong game between the legislature and the Bessie Board and go through however many iterations. So there is a lot to be worked out, and at this stage, therefore, uh, this is just a series of options for your consideration. I do think it bears repeating, just to start here, at this, this slide we did look at before. Um, the base per pupil amount in level one of the formula, as you well know, is $3,961. That amount uh, increased in the two, fiscal 2014. 
Uh, however, it had not increased for several years prior to that, and it has not increased since that time, other than a $20 million appropriation outside of the formula that was made this year. That $20 million was actually a decrease from the, from the $42 million that was outside of the formula the year prior. So in a, in a sense, the total cost of the base per pupil is actually lower than it was if you include the money outside of the formula two years ago. I say this is important and it may be worth the commentary by those in the retirement system. <laughs> Retirement systems is the stuff that you will know about much more than probably most of the rest of us. But uh, this stagnation has come at a point where uh, public schools are experiencing rising obligations, some of which are just a fact of doing business, and some of which are a fact of public policy. Notably, uh, in the year to come, there will be an increase in the obligations that school systems are to pay for retirement systems. And it has been historically the view that the inflationary increase within the formula, which is within the level one uh, element of the formula, should be done in order to keep pace with costs. And one significant cost obligation is the cost for retirement. Obviously, there are a number of ways of addressing that issue from a policy perspective and a number of different views on that issue. But uh, fair to say the obligation will be going up, that's a fact. Fair to say that the amount of base per pupil funding has not. Last year, this task force recommended a 1.375% increase in the base per pupil given uncertainty, uh, which was shy of the recommendation that had made in years previously to have a larger increase and was an attempt to show uh, modesty in the face of a very challenging state budget environment. This year, you know that there will be cost obligation increases, but to show you what, if we were to repeat that again, what it would do, it would increase the per pupil amount that is within the formula to more than $4,000 of the base per pupil, and it would cost the state roughly $35 million. Again, so if you were to repeat the increase from last year, you would roughly keep pace with the retirement obligation increase for next year, and you would roughly increase the overall size of the budget by $35 million. Mr. Paul, question? So, Lieutenant, uh, <clears throat> that $35 million, uh, on what uh, student account is that based? The existing student account, October 1? It's actually it's based on projection for oh, a projection. Did you, say, did you say it's the projection for February? It's the projection, but the cost is not really driven. I know Mike's not suggesting this. The cost is not really driven by an increase in student count. It's driven by an increase in how much you fund each student. Uh, the, the increases that we're seeing year over year are, as we discussed in the last meeting, in size of the cohort, pretty minimal. In fact, this year's cohort kindergarten is down again, statewide. That's not just in Louisiana, that's true in many states across the country. So uh, uh, I think it's fair to say that this, this 35 million is not attributable primarily to a growth in the number of students, it's attributable to the growth in the amount each student is funded. Uh, three years ago, with the lead, under the leadership of this task force, there was a funding stream developed called the High Cost <coughs> Allocation, and uh, many of you were on the Commission of Earth Task Force at that time. It was developed to be, uh, out of a desire to expand a long-running federal program called the, the High Cost Services Pool, which used IDEA money to service the needs of students whose costs ranged typically from $30,000 upward because they have a significant cognitive or orthopedic or other disability that is cost intensive. It was added to the formula, to the MFP formula, as an explicit cost in 2014. This year, 39 city, parish, uh, city and parish school systems and 42 charters have applied, meaning in this current fiscal year, they applied for those services. 
the total of the costs requested and verify within the IEPs of those children is in excess of $30 million. The appropriation or the, the line amount within the formula is for $8 million. Uh, you will recall that the way that, that the formula works in this particular element it is just to say there's a certain amount for it and we will reimburse to the best of our ability. And of course, somebody could look at this and say, well, look, you guys, the more you put, put in the formula, the more the cost goes up. And then there's some truth in that. Uh, but it's also true that all of these costs are attributable to IEPs, which are federal law, that they be implemented. And so uh, one way one could look at the formula this year is that we have a $30 million obligation that we are only funding at $8 million. That, that is in compliance with the idea of a minimum foundation cost and that the state should consider increasing its obligation, increasing its allocation. Good question. John. Charlie. And I may be, I may be phrasing this in a, incorrectly, so forgive me if that's the truth. Would it, because I, I think I heard you say that we spent, we allocated 30 million and we spent about 8 million. Would we, would it be better if we were to revert to our reimbursement process so we could better gauge how much we would really need as opposed to the predictive model that we have now? I wish that were the problem. Unfortunately, the problem is the reverse, which is that districts reimbursed for 30 million what we could only fund under the formula at 8 million. I told you I was going to work it wrong. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm very strong. You're going to get it wrong. I'm very strong. <laughs> But, but is, it, is that something that we could consider? Uh, we've been talking about that for a few years, the whole reimbursement thing, as opposed to this predictive model. Senator, did you? Yeah, I, th I think that we have done it that way in the past, I believe, did, right? When we started. Uh, yeah, and I think part of the problem was people feeling like things change, and thus, as a result, it kind of gets lost in the process, and then they end up doing things that they, can, that they, that they can't uh, uh, be funded to do. We can certainly talk about that. We've actually formed a sub-task force to address that to address that issue. I will tell you, I think the overall issue is we're seeing a huge need for these specific children. Nobody knows that better than you. And yet, the formula really doesn't address those specific additive needs of those kids. And one, and one, of, my, one of my concerns, and then I'll get off of it, but one of my concerns is that because we do have such a disparate gap between what we need and what we have, obviously, are we in some places creating a service delivery model based on the uh, what we purport to be our funding that we may have available as opposed to what the actual need of the child is because you know also that we can't do that so this reimbursement thing we've, we've already made the plan i know what you need so we're going to we're going to do that and wherever the funds come from we're going to do it and we get reimbursed 25 percent of it or 30 percent as opposed to me i think i can get four thousand dollars so i'm you need this $8,000 piece of equipment, but I think we can do a $4,000 service delivery. And it, it becomes not student-centered, it is still more financially motivated, unintentionally as it might be. But that's that's always been my concern. Senator, did you want to answer yeah, that? Yeah, please, um, give me an opportunity to get something wrong. Um, <laughs> is, uh, the, uh, the $30 million that was uh, requested for reimbursement, we only had $8 million in the formula. Is that $8 million included in Thirty-nine sixty-one group. No, I'm sorry, yeah. Senator, I should have said that this is in level four of the formula. Okay. The totally separate calculation. Yes, I apologize. Uh, this will check. But isn't four million through IDEA funding and four million through the MFP funding? Yes. So through MFP, there's a four million dollar appropriation. It was an additional appropriation outside the formula, yes. which was cut. Correct. In the last legislative well. yeah. session, so where we have no money outside of the formula, so there's only four million coming from inside the MFP, and the other four million is being taken from the federal IDEA set aside money that the state has. The way the legislature worded the, the amount of money that Doris is referring to was so broad that it, I think it was meant to make up for the $42 million that was outside of the formula before, but it wasn't nearly as specific as to how the dollars are to be spent. So we didn't include any of those $20 million in the amount that was dedicated to high-cost services. So I should have said this. This amount has, this funding has essentially been cut. Yes. The $4 million, there was $4 million there before that was part of the cut from $42 million to $20 million outside of the formula. 
and you know, I recognize we can say this all we want, and this is just the challenge of, of running a legislature, but this is the kind of thing that happens when the money gets put outside the formula. Right, so we would have had a pot of 12 million to reimburse, four in the MFD, four through IDEA, and four outside the formula. Right. Uh, to, to go after that 30 million, but the four outside the family was cut up. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, you know, um, I think it's good that there are funds, high cost, funds for high cost services. And I, um, one thing that Charlie was mentioning is verifying whether those expenses actually occurred has, was brought to my attention is not happening. I think that's, that's one point. Um, the second point, probably the major point, is, is my understanding when this task force was first commissioned, it was its purpose was to determine the cost to educate students. And um, this reflects nowhere is that more problematic than kids who need a lot of services and supports. And so outside of the MFP, in addition to Senator Morris, you're looking at like level one. Um, you know, when you look at levels one, two, and three, the increase from 13, 14 was actually $171 per kid. It kept rising a little bit every year because of levels two and three. This, that was just level one. But even outside of the state and local share, there's a billion dollars of local funds that are out there. And, you know, I just discovered about a week ago that extended school year funding was cut. That was about $3 million that used to go to school systems. And, I, you know, it's putting more and more of a crunch on how y'all, I, I wonder how y'all are going to service kids when I'm looking at all these cuts. Um, and it actually it begs the question of how much does it cost to serve kids well. And that question was never really answered in, to my understanding. And I think it's going to pose an increasingly difficult task to keep asking for more funds if we can't definitively answer that question. I'll just leave it there. Well, let, let me, I think it's a very valid point. I would say that in the first year of this task force, having not the overall adequacy costs survey that, that was that people have been urging. Um, but there was an exercise to determine whether or not the formula was covering the cost of servicing students with disabilities as a whole. And uh, we did the analysis using the data that's submitted by schools and, and uh, school system. And I, I believe it came out to say that the answer was no. That actually the formula does not well, fund. Maybe, maybe you're correct, right? Maybe yeah. that's the problem. Is well, the answer, I think the answer is no. And I think everybody on the task force agreed that the formula does not fund, in the way that it treats students with disabilities, does not fund those kids on average what they cost on average, or what they are reported to cost on average. At that time, what, what we also identified was the main driver of that was that there is a small number of kids who cost, whose services cost well beyond what the system reimburses or compensates school systems for. And so you actually had a relatively small percentage of the kids who have IEPs driving those uh, extraordinary costs. So the solution was to create a category that at least began to address that problem. Um, I think probably anybody who was there at the time would tell you that uh, the problem has not been fully addressed and that this category neither fully addresses the problem nor is itself fully funded. But that every request that's been made by this body has been restrained given the financial climate that, that we're in. Mr. Richard? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, since the State Superintendent White is right on target, to Sean's question, there has been several legislative resolutions requesting uh, a study to determine what it costs to educate a student in 2017 or in current times. I'm not sure if we've ever moved forward that. In it was cut. This is the legislature got right. the contract, three hundred thousand dollar contract. The LSU, if I'm not mistaken, on the piece about adequately serving SPED students. I think the other takeaway from that analysis is State Superintendent White 
mentioned was the fact that the local districts are putting up disproportionately more than what the state provides through state funding to service our SPED students because we have to. And if this is not the right time to tell me, but as we're talking about the, the amount of money that local school districts are funding special ed students, we have exactly the same problem with 504 students, except the state doesn't fund anything on 504, just because that's not the mechanism that's in place. So what I wanted to propose is that we consider at some point, I don't know if this is the meeting to do it, but that we consider maybe having a weighted count for 504 students because the number of 504 students is going up as our special ed numbers are going down. RTI is addressing the special ed increase in enrollment. It really is doing a very good job, which is also unfunded. So we lose federal dollars and, and weighted dollars because we're doing a good job with an unfunded mandate of RTI. 504 numbers, we don't have the luxury or the ability to comply with federal law to be able to do anything to bring those numbers down other than make sure that we're following the requirements. But those services are becoming very expensive. It's, and it's not just services directly to the children, it's the process that's costing us a fortune. The people to make sure that we have the meetings, that we're discussing and that we're collecting the data. So we need to have something in place more than just what we're, we're proposing so that we can make up for some of those costs. Because as my superintendent told me, you know, superintendents are going after the money wherever they can. If we can't get it in one place, we're gonna find it in another place. And my concern is that we start looking in places that that's gonna hamper services in other areas. We, we actually took this question up several years ago as well, um, and, and what were not extraordinary times, but better times. I know. Um, I think the feeling of the group we did, we looked at the enrollments of uh, attention deficit disorder, ADHD, dyslexia, and a lot of the 504 classifications, and they were going way, way up. Uh, I think the feeling of the group was that beginning to tackle that issue and the formula, given the complexities of all of those conditions, having not even addressed those kids that have IEPs under IDEA fully wasn't the, wasn't the right move. But I, I do think that in the kind of study that Scott's talking about, it would be necessary. Yeah. And in while, and while you're doing it, the, the issue I think is not so much, the special ed is the services that we provide. For 504 right now, it's the process, and the process is fairly consistent for every child. So it's a little bit easier to predict what you're gonna need for that. Thank you. Superintendent? Yeah. So this kind of gets at some of the things that Superintendent Voce was saying. Um, this is the way that this appropriation has worked within the formula, and uh, she's right. There was, a, there was an increase a couple of years ago that then got reduced when money outside the formula was cut. So you could imagine in this year's formula doing something like where you as a task force, ultimately Bessie, sets a goal that we're going to increase the percentage of students whose costs are funded fully under this dimension of the formula. And I'm the first to say that, that I, agree, I agree with Sean that you, sh you shouldn't have a system where cost is driven by uh, where, as it regards servicing students with disabilities where the the funding for it is driven by the limits of what is available. Ideally, that should be an academic decision. Uh, however, knowing competing needs and knowing constraints at this time, one option could be to set a goal, say, in this case, 50%, and to say, how could we get to servicing 50% of the need through this formula? In this case, uh, the amount available to get to 50% would cost roughly $7 million for the state. Mr. Chair, I have, I have another um, question. It's just for, I guess, Beth in the future. Um, there's a, a maintenance of effort requirement. I mean, I, that's not the exact term, but essentially the state has to provide the same amount of uh, state <coughs> support for students with disabilities from year to year. <coughs> Last year when the IDEA um, plan and budget came out that um, 
the number that was given in there was lower than the previous year, and I made a mention of it, and y'all corrected it, um, so that to, to reflect that we, we did spend more than we did the previous year. And I, I just heard two different cuts of state funds that would bring us considerably lower, millions of dollars lower than the previous year. And I, I would just like you to follow up with me later on uh, the impact of that to our, our maintenance of state financial support. Thank you. Thank you. The final area where we're seeing is within the formula, the demands for cost uh, outstrip the capacities to generate revenue for school systems. Is it the other area that was cut to uh, Doris your point outside of the formula when those reductions were made last year? And that is in the supplemental course allocation. This amount had been increased to $35 per child for every child in grades seven through 12 over what it is now, which is $26 per child. When that cut was made, revenue was dropped. Uh, and the result, as you see here, based on the appropriation, is a lot less money available for courses that are not provided to students typically within the four walls of their middle or high school. That includes access to career training programs through the Course Choice Program, to uh, fair access to ACT preparation, and primarily to dual enrollment, which funds uh, students directly by cutting down on their tuitions because it gives them early college credits. Uh, it also funds our higher education system and our school system's ability to fund higher education. Another way you could think about this would be to double that rate. The demand that we're, we have for early college courses under Superintendent Brookhouse and doing you know, all the work you do at Soella and at Magnese uh, is really through the roof. And the constraint, uh, among others, that school systems have on it is the ability to pay tuition. It's fair to say that tuition has increased too uh, in the institutions of higher learning. When these funds were made available in 2014, tuitions largely went back up. Uh, but you could imagine setting a goal and say doubling uh, the amount of every child grade six through tw seven through twelve, which would allow literally tens of thousands more kids to gain dual enrollment credits early, to get uh, industry-based credentials within uh, the industry, and that would cost the state again roughly eight million dollars if you did that. Bessie will be considering their formula uh, on the formula on the 7th and 8th of March. The 8th, on the 7th, they'll be heard in the committee meeting, and the 8th, they'll be heard uh, by the full board. And Bessie must submit a new formula to the legislature by the 15th of March. Uh, just to remind you, today's the, the purpose of this uh, body is to advise Bessie in making that decision. It's not to make a policy itself. It's not to advise the governor on. Although he obviously has a representative here, Mr. Sanji, but it's not to advise the governor as he sets his executive budget. It's instead to advise the board. In the past, uh, for how you've done that recommendation has varied. And you're under no obligation to make a recommendation, but how you've done it has varied. Sometimes it's been a specific formula, and Bessie has tended to adopt that. Sometimes it's been just certain factors within the formula. Um, this year we really are, I think, in extraordinary times. This is the first time we've ever held this uh, meeting this late where there is an active current fiscal year deficit going on. And so this is unquestionably the most challenging financial time that this group has ever met in before. But uh, we lay those three ideas out there as three areas where clearly there will be, there's an increased demand or cost. That is, the formula is not meeting. Um, you can take the discussion, of course, in whatever way you like, but that is the, the best, most pragmatic information given the financial environment uh, to make it available. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. I do want to point out for those who want to put a comment in, comment cards on the right side of the room over there. Uh, so we will have time for public comment at some point, so just be aware of that. Michelle? Yeah, I just want to make sure um, clear. So the, on the um, supplemental course allocations, that was part of the funding that came outside the form. Not originally. Okay, but but last, okay, explain that part. In 2000, 
So you want me to actually smile? <laughs> in 2000, thanks. Okay. In 2014, it was put into formula for the 15th fiscal year at 26. Sorry, for the 14th fiscal year, 26 dollars. The board then tried to increase it to $35, and the legislature didn't pass it. But the legislature did put it outside the formula at $35 per student. That amount was then stripped out at extra $9 last year. So it's basically in the formula back at $26, and there's nothing outside the formula for this particular uh, cost. Okay. So, so just to make sure, the, so what you're proposing, sort of, is that this go back in the formula, but it be doubled to the $52 per student for allocation. Well, I'm, I'm nudging in that direction okay. because we know that we're turning kids away from dual enrollment courses and the rationale is that there's not any longer the availability to provide those funds. Now, you could debate that policy all you, know, all you want. I'm just suggesting that in these three areas, we have evidence that cost is outstripping Sorry, that the, it's not stripping the revenue. And if your obligation is to make recommendations vis-a-vis -vis the formula, then um, those are three ways of looking at that. Now, you could very reasonably say you know, there's a whole set of other recommendations, or you could say there shouldn't be any changes. And that's, of course, you know, your, your freedom to think that way one way or the other. But we're putting these on the table as the most obvious and pragmatic times or areas for this time. Michelle. Just, just so we can keep a perspective, one of the things with, uh, with something like supplemental course allocation, when special ed students are involved in it, there are additional costs that go with that. When we're talking about going outside of the, the school district, district, whatever, there's been a recent court case, and I think it was in our circuit, but I don't have it with me, that said that the school district is responsible for providing faith no matter where the course and the education is taking place. So for example, if a child needs a one-on-one, -on -one, Para or needs para support, and it's not one on one, it's even worse. We have to provide that support on the job site or wherever the child is receiving the education. So, it and I know, and I'm saying this like it, like we lived in an ideal time. I'm, I am self aware, I think that that's not reality, but we probably need to look at actually doing a weighted count for this as well because we have to provide additional services above and beyond. And it is not something if it's provided through general fund or some, it cannot be provided through IDEA for others. So we need to just keep that in mind because this is all chipping away at the bottom line in our general fund. It's killing us. And I can't imagine that we're not in better shape probably than many other districts. Noted. We're going to call. Looking at each one of these, there's no bad proposal because it impacts kids. The reality is having to work uh, within the confines of limited resources. And as, as you look through this, I think because we are an MFP task force, the primary thing, and I believe is the most important thing to school districts, and I would like to see the, the, the group establish priorities that we could go to Bessie and say this would be priority number one, this would be priority number two, and priority number three. And I think the top priority for school districts is the base per pupil. Because if, the, if, if you don't have the base per pupil and you have the money outside of the formula, then the same thing that it's happening this year where the $20 million supplemental appropriation that we received is going to be cut. We also have the 5% EEF tobacco funds that's going to be cut. So many districts are going to provide those services that are required for special needs kids. Many districts are going to provide the services that are needed for supplemental course allocations. They're going to provide those things, but they're going to provide them within the, the confines of their MFP and their local tax dollars, and not so much what's going to happen outside of the formula, because it's, it's, it's been in flux the last several years. So I, I would say that in 
my view, the most important priority would be the 1.375 request to be placed into the base per pupil because that generates 35 million. I think we got the figures to show that just the TRSL increase is going to cost 30 million. So 38 million. So the 35 million still we, we, we have to we're going to still come up short. Yes, just to, to support you know what Mike was saying, that's what I was going to say is you know, we have to break down for every school district. It's, it's 38 million TRS alone. Uh, Mr. Bujol could probably tell you how much it would cost school systems uh, with ELSERS on the increase we're going to have with theirs. And just looking at our district with health insurance, you know, the, uh, from our school system, it's 750,000 for teachers' retirement, but we have another with the rate increase that we have on health insurance, another $1.8 million increase uh, with health insurance coming. So, and I'm sure a lot of other districts are going to be experiencing a similar type of thing. Uh, we do, if you wouldn't mind, we do have a, a, a sheet that shows that on the teacher's retirement. If you would like to pass out. Mr. Sean. Uh, so at this point, it would be, uh, we need to know what the governor's going to propose in his uh, executive budget. Uh, he's been working with the Division of Administration for quite some time. We've, you know, they've considered all of these things. There's been a lot of back and forth, a lot of, a lot of talk with this. And I know you all understand the, um, the complexity, the difficulty of the process of doing all that. <clears throat> the governor's uh, ultimate goal, of course, is to have a budget process that is realistic, that is consistent, stable, and doesn't use one-time money, and, and is, is something that's predictable. That's something that is going to be uh, an extremely difficult battle for him uh, this session and, and maybe for, for sessions to come. Um, and and in, in talking about the uh, the MFP, which is a, of course the, the big considerable part of the of the state budget, uh, they he and the, the division of administration looked at the three particular increases that uh, that has been talked about here, and. Um, uh, they decided and uh, had got this information this morning that they cannot support the per pupil increase in the executive budget. The uh, high cost services, they will propose an increase, and actually it's a little bit larger than what uh, Superintendent White said, an increase of $8 million in that portion, of, but inside the MFP, and uh, an increase of $10 million in the supplemental course allocation. That is, uh, what's that? $10 million for the supplemental course uh, allocation. Again, these would entirely fund those, but would, would, uh, would provide funding in those two areas uh, that, that, of course, I mean, all the areas are, are important, but those are something that he would like to see back in the, um, uh, in the MSB itself, protected that way. So the, the budget that executive budget that he will uh, propose in February would be uh, no increase in the per pupil, uh, uh, up to eight million increase in the high cost services, and up to ten million dollar increase in the uh, supplemental course allocation. Thank you, Mr. Simon. I think that's a very important bit of information for us to have in this group, realizing that uh, we are putting forth recommendations, but we have to be very realistic and or pragmatic, depending on how you look at it. So thank you for sharing that with us. Any other media thoughts, Ms. Gosha? Uh, just a question. Do we have, I realize we haven't done the February 1 count yet. Um, do we have any idea what the mid-year adjustment in the ballpark, what that will be, what is it going to be an increase, and how much of one that we have to send the VA seven over for the supplemental we're appropriations? Five, five, five to seven. Five to seven million dollars. That's what we're yeah. Okay, which is much better than <laughs> than it's been in the past. Yeah. Well, that's that's uh, and that's pretty good. Yeah. It's, it's a credit to the administration. I mean. 
the, well, the, there's other reasons for it. The, 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 uh, there's been not as much of a population shift in the way there was before, but we finally got the methodology to a point where the projections are more reasonable on the front end. So. Right. I think uh, this administration last year had a much better projection within the executive budget than <coughs> we've had prior to. Sure. So only five to seven notes. Oh, yes. One thing uh, not being brought out is that the Louisiana Constitution uh, states that a minimum foundation, minimum program of education must be funded. And whenever you fund something outside of the formula, you're taking money away from funding the minimum educational program that needs to be provided to students. I'm not saying, I don't, I don't want it to be taken up, that I'm saying anything derogatory about the high cost, because I, I know about the high cost, or the supplemental course allocation, but we're taking away from the minimum program of education that we are required by the Constitution to provide and to fund. Thank you. Three short. Just want to echo the comments of Superintendent Paul, oh, and, and I'm sure the governor's office has their various reasons why they were making this type of announcement today. But to go back and reiterate, you know, that, that minimum level of funding is captured in the per pupil allocation, and uh, it's not to diminish the the funding streams or the programs that are being discussed today and the menu of options that we've been presented with, but the priority from school board's perspective is certainly the uh, the increase in the per pupil amount. Uh, yes, sir, Superintendent. We, we certainly understand my background is financial, even though I'm superintendent. I, I understand the, the funding issues across the state. Um, I think modifying the formula today with any detailed modification would be a mistake. It, it's so complicated anyway. It just muddies the water. It's certainly going to get reverted back to the prior year if we modify the formula. I, I think you've identified three great areas where there's money. Over the years, I've learned that the more you dedicate things, the more you hamstring yourself when it comes to ordinary everyday expenditures. Um, for simplicity, it's, it's the same as me not having any money and you tell me you're going to provide me light bulbs, but I can't pay my electricity. So what good are the light bulbs going to do me if I can't keep my electricity? That, that's that's kind of how I look at dedications now. It, it, it gets dangerous. And, and I realize high cost and SCA are, are definitely needed. Um, I, I'm living proof of that with Soil and Magnese and all the new credit we, we provide. But the retirement and health care, um, the ordinary step increases in the salary schedule that we you know, provide every year. Um, I, I have a situation, we were talking this morning about work, workers' comp. Um, you may or may not know if a teacher is injured by a child, it's not workers' comp, it's called assault pay which means they receive 100% of their salary if they're injured by a child. I have three teachers right now on assault pay who were injured by the same child. The child, by the way, would fall into the high cost area because I now am educating that child with one teacher and one parent alone in a classroom with that child. So it, it, it fits all these categories. The workers comp would need to be covered in the per pupil increase. The high cost would need to cover the child with the teacher in the parent, which is over a hundred grand for that one child. And I have a number of those. Um, I've talked to other superintendents who are experiencing the same thing um, as far as uh, mental health issues among children today. Well, they just can't function in normal classrooms. Um, you have to you know, create those environments where they can be successful, and that involves a teacher and a parent in a lot of cases. So I guess what I'm saying is, while I appreciate the effort to put dedicated money in outside of the formula, if we can't cover the bare essentials of what we have to cover, the dedicated money just doesn't mean as much when you do it. So. Uh, I'll come back to you, Michelle. Um, 
so, so two, two questions. One is, my understanding, is that going to be outside of the formula? Because I thought it was going to be in the formula. What, I just nothing, nothing that, sorry. Nothing that this group does is, is about what's outside of it's the all in legislature can right. do that, but so, this is all about recommending About us. what would go into the formula. And then the second question I would have, because I, I actually think all three proposals are necessary. I think it is the duty of Bessie and this commission to do what's right for kids. And if that means that we have to ask for the amount and somebody has to say, no, we can't have that amount, then we do a disservice if we don't ask for it to begin with. Um, second thing that I would say, if up to 10 million and up to 8 million is, in my head, uh, 3 million over what, what the formula you're asking for, then at least that other 3 million that's kind of out there could be put in, in the per pupil amount. Because if I heard uh, what the governor's uh, going to recommend, it sounded like about 18 million. And um, so. And just to, just to put that in context, the governor obviously can, can put things in the budget. He represents the MFP as a line in the budget. It's just one appropriation within the budget. And of course, he can say, this, I'm urging Bessie to do this and to do that. He, in fact, though, doesn't write the formula. Right. It, Bessie writes the formula. And uh, ultimately, the legislature either approves it or doesn't approve it. So, so what I would take from from that is, you know, that's that's guidance to Bessie in a way. But at the same time, Bessie's going to have to figure out how that money is divvied up as to your day. Okay. Senator Procopio, come back you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. uh, from my perspective, and I understand the one you said we're trying to do what's best for kids. Uh, I don't think I'm going to vote for any of these just because I don't think in a time of this uncertainty, uh, fiscal uncertainty, that we can really afford any of them. Um, that said, I understand my perspective is going to be an extreme minority, if, if not a minority of one. Um, it, that said, I think it, what it might be useful, and what I've heard, is that the idea of setting priorities is probably a very good one. Uh, and if the priority of this group uh, is to increase the base pay, as in these other ones, uh, for reasons of dedications or whatever, and you know that the governor has roughly $18 million he's planning an executive budget, it might be helpful to communicate that to him and say, we would rather have $18 million and a 0.75% increase in the base formula than $18 million in specific programs. And that communication, I mean, you can ignore it or whatever, you might put that as the proposal, um, as a chance that something actually might make through the process, if that's where you prefer to send the money spent in. Me, I don't want to see anything in the formula, but I'm just sort of communicating that might be a solution. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Michelle. And if I could piggyback on what Carl said, the way it doesn't matter how much money we put in high cost services accounts, if that happens after the deadline for application, he's still spending all that money, but he cannot benefit from the whatever amount of money we have in the high cost services allocation because we're not doing a reimbursement; we're doing a projection, and he's past the projection time. Does that happen to us? We still have to provide the services, but there was no reimbursement. Keep it in perspective. Thank you for that. Ms. Mr. Sanji, did I hear correctly that the eight million and the ten million would be inside the MFP or will they be outside in the executive budget? It'll be inside the MFP. Okay, so the way I see this, we we have a couple of options and, I, and we all want what's best for kids here. If we increase the per pupil, which the governor has said is unaffordable at this time. I think we almost 100% ensure that the legislature will be forced to return it and we will lose the opportunity to have $18 million put inside the MFP safely. Rich Garvey. Yes, uh, kind of along the same lines, someone said that maybe we should make a suggestion to the governor that uh, some of what uh, he proposed be put into the per pupil amount instead of where he's proposing it, because uh, maybe he's not aware that uh, we would prefer to have it in the per pupil amount. But I want to back up and ask uh, Superintendent White, didn't you send to the governor some suggestions that included an increase in the per pupil amount? Uh, not, no, not, not so far this year. Uh, I thought Mr. Sanji said that he got, when you recommended in the slideshow, he got that this morning. Uh, we certainly have discussed it, uh, but we have not uh, communicated anything to the governor. I'm sure Mr. Sanji has communicated to the governor 
So my point is that I think he already knows that uh, putting some in the per pupil amount would be what some people at this table would like and has told us nonetheless the best way to go about getting an MFP approved, as you said, in protecting a certain amount of this money would be to put it in the uh, high cost and the SCA funds and not to send it back over to the legislature with something else in it and take the risk that it gets just turned down and doesn't even get considered as what happened last year and was it the year before also? Last couple years, yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. And back to uh, being realistic here, and sometimes it's the, uh, the bird in hand scenario to some degree. Of course, it's the will of the committee as we move through this. I have a question, if you don't mind. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Superintendent, I know S at this point is frozen, but if it goes on and is implemented as it currently is, the direct services that will be required under ESSA, would that come in under the supplemental course allocation piece? Well, that's an option for states uh, to target 3% toward courses that otherwise wouldn't be provided within the school, tutoring, uh, early college coursework, career training, enrichment services. Um, if Louisiana does do that, that would start, uh, could start in the 17, 18 years. I know some of that might be eligible under title funding, but I'm just wondering if our costs are going to increase in that category. Uh, you know, to be honest with you, I think the demand is there. It, 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 now? Yeah, is there, yeah, yeah. All right, we're, uh, just, just we're getting there. Just get a sure. clarification point. ESSA isn't, ESSA isn't going to bring us any more money. It's just going to give us the money that we have and allow us to redistribute it in a different manner, correct? Yeah, that's right. And, and the SSA looks to us like the appropriations for Louisiana are going to be, the allocations are going to be pretty, pretty much consistent with where they were. Ms. Okay, uh, I understand everything that is being said, but at some point we need to get down to brass tacks of deciding what we want to do. Um, I'm along, I go along with Ms. Shum. I think that we need to at least have a vote on whether or not we put the 1.375% increase as, a, as is being recommended by the superintendent. So I make that motion. So I have a motion for you for including as an option the uh, MFP increase. Right. And we second. Have a second. I'd make a substitute motion. Pursue motion being that we not include the per pupil increase only the 10 and 8 that um, we know could be available through the governor's education advisor. So, the substitute motion then would be for no base MFB increase, but for the uh, you said 9, 10, I believe the numbers were 8 and 10. 8 for HCS, the 10 for SCS. I'll need a second for that to move that any further. Second, second by Mr. Garvey. Uh, I guess I have a question, and I'm not totally familiar with how the budgets are proposed. But my assumption, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Sanji, when the governor incorporates money for the MFP in his executive budget, you really, I thought it was just a line, of MFP, so much money. That's correct. So it's not broken down into what categories so if, if, he, if he puts in an $18 million increase with, um, I guess it would be some verbiage requesting it be in these particular areas. But we haven't really, uh, Superintendent White, from what he's saying, hasn't really had, um, I guess, an in-depth discussion with him about these particular categories yet. And I guess that will come in time prior to the Bessie meeting. So maybe we could do something, and I realize we have motions on the floor, um, but with the consideration of the $18 million increase in the executive budget, it doesn't mean it's going to go through the legislature that way, but with, the, um, with his proposal in there, if we could maybe as a committee rank what these would be, and whether it be the MF per pupil increase first with these other two, just to maybe a recognition from the committee that we feel that if money is available, that we would look at these three particular items 
and we could do it in whichever order the committee feels, but be inclusive of all three items, you know, pending further discussion with this, this uh, state superintendent and the governor's office, and with that recommendation and going to Bessie in March. But just, I, I would like to see a recognition from the committee, possibly if we feel all three areas are important, um, recognizing the 18 million hopefully will be available, and then we could rank the order in which we feel we would like to see that happen. Yes, and, and make no mistake, the, the governor would much love to, to put every increase in there. If the funding was there, he would definitely do that. But he is, he's putting a realistic budget out there. And, and, and you're right, the governor does not write the MFP, he budgets a line item for the MFP. Right. So, uh, but, but he will, uh, I'm sure, uh, make his wishes known about those two particular priorities that, that he has uh, uh, talked to me about. I, if I could add just a comment to what Doris just said, I, I, I really agree with the spirit of that. Uh, and here's, here's why. I think that, first of all, I think it was a very well-worded, sharp motion. Um, the only thing I would say is that at this stage, um, I hate to at this stage take stuff off the table, because ultimately, Bessie's the one that has to go through the prioritizing. So what, what I would probably suggest is a little different from Doris, is that we approve these as options that Bessie must prioritize in establishing the formula. That would be my, my now you could go through the kind of prioritizing, Doris, that you're suggesting, um, and that would certainly be an exercise. I think it's gonna be candidly very difficult to come away with anything other than six people think this is a priority, eight people think this is a priority, and four people think this is a priority. I don't really know what that tells Bessie. Instead, I would say, are these important options for Bessie to consider as it prioritizes? Bessie will be voting after the governor puts out a budget, and if the budget says the MFP, to Stephen's point, is going to be $18 million higher, that should give Bessie real instruction. I think at this stage, taking an option off the table is not smart strategically for a whole set of reasons. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Richard. Yes, I, I certainly agree with Superintendent White and Superintendent Boche. Uh, I think that the menu option that in this presentation is probably the best uh, route for this advisory group to give suggestions as to, to where fund what should be funded in the MFP to Bessie, who ultimately will make those recommendations. This is a very fluid process that we're embarking on. There's a lot of things that may come out of joint budget uh, tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken, Friday, if I'm not mistaken. Things are very fluid <coughs> as to the fiscal state of our state, and uh, to take options off, I think, would be a mistake at this time. Uh, I think there's a, a sentiment for that amongst the group. I'm just not sure how we get there with the current motions that are on the table. So, so I'll, I'll take back the second to make it or or make it clear that our the motion was to include all three, not just to include one. Uh, Debbie, correct? I understood that the 18 million was going to be put into the executive budget. I wanted to make sure that the uh, increase for for pupil was also part of of the uh, the formula that was being considered. I think, and somebody, I'm sure I have lots of folks who will correct me shortly, but I think uh, maybe the best way to handle this would be either a very clean substitute motion that that, that uh, succinctly defines the three as an option, as, as equal option, so to speak, to be reviewed by Bessie, or to vote down where we are and start fresh. Um, so, with a substitute motion that, that would clearly uh, state the three as options to be reviewed by Bessie, be available, or do we need to vote on the substitute motion that stands in favor right now? I'll make a substitute to the substitute then. Yeah. Okay. The uh, then can we do two. Two. Can we do two? That's right. I don't know. Unless you want to be withdrawn, and then I'll we have a second. So we can vote it down and start up, start back with yours. Vote down and start over. I right? think. Well, it would be fun to do a fourth substitute, but I'm willing to withdraw. <laughs> First of all, though, does not Bessie have the option to do what it wants to do with or without yes, our motion? Yes. Yeah. Also, does this really restrict the funding 
in the sense that we give districts block grants and we really don't have a dollar follow the child or the course at this moment anyway? You mean, do, are those restricted funding streams? Yes, I guess that's my question. They are not restricted in the way that a grant would be, but as Carl knows, uh, when you create that as a specific cost structure, you can audit it in a way where you verify whether the dollars really did go to that cost or not. So it's not restricted like a grant, but it is more auditable because it's attributable to a specific cost. So at this point, I've heard a couple different things here. Uh, I'm still looking at you, Bridget, on this. Are you withdrawing the motion? Are we going to leave the motion there to be voted on? I, I will withdraw it. Let's start clean. Mm -hmm. So that leaves us another motion that we could, that either uh, was a little bit, I think, maybe misleading for the whole group, but we didn't follow the, the logic of that in terms of it being all three. Um, so do we want to I think that the consensus that is that we sent to the, that's the, uh, the three options, that they need to be prioritized so that we can get the best uh, so the motion here, uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Richard. I I just like to add in this moment, if you'll allow, that the the motion include that the per pupil increase would be ranked as the highest priority, with the other two to follow. I would be amenable to that. As option. So at this point, make sure I'm understanding our, our motion so that we're all on the same page. The motion would be to have all three of these there with the priority, from the recommendation of the priority be on MFP uh, based funding before the other two. Is that correct? That's correct. All right, question for Spark? Yeah, I'd like to point out a couple of things that I would have thought would be pretty obvious, um, apparently maybe not. Uh, the, the, as Ms. Boche said, or pointed out, with what's in the governor's budget is phrased a certain way, there's a certain amount of money, and it doesn't say much more, but what he's telling us is what he thinks he has the political capital to get passed is what he's proposing in those two categories. And he doesn't, this is what I'm taking from it anyway, doesn't have the political capital to sell the per pupil. Now, he's working with the legislature, people, he's talking to them every day. We are not talking to them every day. So I would believe that uh, he has a better feel for what's going on than I do. Um, and what we do here today is not going to be done in a vacuum. The legislators themselves are likely to read about it in the paper. Uh, there may be a reporter in the room writing about this kind of stuff reporting about it tomorrow, and what they see is going to affect their opinion throughout the legislative session. If they see Bessie or a committee of Bessie asking for more money, more money, more money, when everybody else around the state is getting cut, I think it's going to leave a bad taste in the mouths of a lot of legislators, and that bad taste is liable to last the whole session. So. Uh, if we are going to put all three in a recommendation to Bessie, I would recommend that we put the per pupil at the bottom of the list because that's what one of our experts is telling us the most political uh, possible thing to do. Uh, <coughs> he's suggesting that we do that, I, I would think. Thank you. Well, it seems to me there's a couple ways you could interpret this. You could either, Scott has his proposal for a ranking. I took Bridget's proposal that she's got some ranking. I know it was a little bit different from that, but she's got a ranking. Or you could just be where I am, which is for no ranking. Let's wait a couple months and work it out when Bessie gets it. Uh, I think we've got a motion on the floor. My sense is we should take the vote on the motion on the floor. If it passes, it passes. If it doesn't, then we've got to look at it. should we have no priority ranking or a different priority ranking. Uh, Ms. Shum, you have so, okay. I, I just want a point of clarification because there are people listening to uh, what's being said about what dollars, and I just want to point out that this is not additional money because three years ago there was $42 million in the budget to cover these same things. That money dropped to $20 million and then now it may drop to zero, I mean, depending on where it is. 
So I just want to point out, it is not asking for, it's, it's restoring money that was there outside of the formula, but putting it in the formula, correct? I think everything you said is right. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Also, I also have a question, a point of clarification. Is, so is the, the motion on the floor, is it, if there's additional money, this is how we would like to see it prioritized? Or is it, we want additional money for these priorities? Because to me, that's a very important difference. I believe it's the It is the latter. We, we want additional money for these priorities. Correct. Okay, all right, thanks. The question uh, so the motion, you have a question? Yes. Um, for those who are uh, indicating the uh, priority should be placed on high cost and uh, supplemental course allocations, within those two, is there any priority of one over the other for various reasons? No, and actually, I wouldn't necessarily say that they were my priority, but I'm just you know, what the right governor right. has said, he would fund, and when every other governmental service is getting cut, we have the opportunity to increase our MFP by $18 million, and we're arguing about it. So, I'm making sure, does it have a question over here? If I may. Ms. Smith? Um, hi, Joni Smith. I'm a classroom teacher, and so I just wanted to be a voice for that for a moment. Not sure how many of you have been in the classroom setting. If you are, I'll pray to you. <laughs> um, but just to piggyback on your ideas and what um, an inclusion classroom looks like nowadays, um, that spectrum is very vast, as you may very well know. We moved from an area where we have students with needs of hearing impairments, vision impairments, all the way to the needs of non-speaking English, those ELL kids. And they sit in our classrooms and sometimes they're lost because funding is not available to support their needs. And so I ask you to guard these funds. I think that we need to make sure we're considering those kids and their needs. I hear a conversation being said that we care for these kids, we have concern for their needs, we want to meet their needs, but we have to meet all their needs. And so I do agree with the base care. Um, for each pupil, of course, I want that funding to be applied, but also to please consider those high cost students. Um, we're going to see detrimental effects. We'll see a decrease in proficiency, we'll see the drop out, drop out rate in, um, increase, and we don't want that for our state. Those kids are very influential to society. Those kids are also, if you follow the statistics, these are high-risk kids in our, in our communities. So I want, I want to make sure we're guarding those funds and consider the needs for HCS. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, Mo, oh, a couple more hands over here. All right, let's go to Michelle first. Um, and I think, I think a lot of this is going to be marketing. Because what you're saying is true. We are arguing about $18 million, but I think the argument could also be made that we're accepting gracefully a $3 million cut since the increased cost in our retirement is gonna actually be 38 million when the MFP change in per pupil amount will be 35 million. So I think the argument can be made that we are accepting a $3 million cut when everyone else is. So I think we have to look at it and see how we how we think about it, how we discuss it. Ms. Mo? I just wanna say that um, my motion is not meant as any kind of um, negative comment on the governor and his executive budget but rather it comes from the the responsibility that i bear as a representative of children and parents and i believe that i that i need to say that we need this money if the committee votes it down that is a vote of the committee and i accept that but personally and philosophically I represent the children and, the, and their, uh, their parents. So I need to say that, and I need to have it officially you know, reported. It's not any comment on the governor or his, his budget. It's just my need to fulfill my responsibility. Okay. Mr. Fall. Mr. Garvey, we don't control the ink in the bathtub, so it's, it's hard for us to control what's going to be written. Uh, we have made recommendations from this task force before to Bessie, that is best, Bessie has voted down because that's their purview. The members of Bessie, the superintendent, are going to be in communication with the governor, his staff, legislative leaders, and y'all are going to know better what the layout is. And when you get to the meeting on March the 7th and you have your finance committee meeting, 
you're going to make a decision based on the facts that you have before you. And if there are facts that show this extra money, then you know where the priorities of this group lie. If there's not extra money, then you know that there's a snowball's chance that if you ask for something, it's not going to get through. So I, I would encourage us to, as a body, to make a list of options for Bessie to consider. So we need to take action here. We've, we've got the motion on the floor. If I'm, we've been through a lot of, we covered a lot of ground. But uh, it's for the three options. But I believe it, it's, it, it stops with an emphasis, a priority on base people to increase funding. Is that correct? Yeah. All right. So, uh, unless you're, and, then you, and you say that's where you want to stay with that. So the vote needs to be on that, remembering that if, uh, if this is voted down, then you can bring another motion that would be equal uh, in terms of how you bring this option up. I think we're all on the same page of having the three there. It's a matter of priority or not of one. So may I clarify? Mm -hmm. May I clarify the motion, Mr. Chairman? Certainly. I want to make sure that, Mr. Richard, this is in line with your motion. It's not a free short motion, I don't believe, or did you? It's my motion, but I think second. Scott wrote Tammy's motion. Second. I can be very clear that the, the items be presented in the order in which they presented it in this PowerPoint, which starts with Got it. So, so this is a motion, Debbie, to, to propose as options to Bessie, increasing the base per pupil by 1.375, increasing the supplemental course allocation by $26 per child, and increasing by uh, $7 million the high cost services allocation, with a consideration toward a, toward a priority on the base per pupil. And I don't care if it's cross-motion online. <laughs> That's the motion we're voting on there. All right, so everyone's on the same page there. Um, do we need to do a roll call vote for this? Yes. All right, roll call vote. Remember, Foxy don't, uh, can't vote in ex officio. Mr. Brookhouse? Yes. Mr. Davis? Um, you can wait. Go to that right. chair. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Sell? Mr. Falk? Yes. Mr. Garvey? No. Dr. Leger? No. Ms. Moe? Yes. Mr. Malone? Yes. Senator Morsh? Yes. Ms. Nealon? No. Ms. Posey? Yes. Dr. Procopio? No. Mr. Richard? Yes. Ms. Romer? No. Ms. Rushing? Ms. Shum? Yes. Ms. Smith? Yes. Mr. Sanji? Yes. Dr. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Boshe? Yes. And Superintendent White? No. Did you guys see Motion passes. Here we go. Motion passes. All work is done. Uh, is there any other business? Do we have any comments we need to uh, but we have one, one, one comment that wishes to speak. Um, Ms. April Dunn? We do have one public comment, uh, Ms. Dunn. I think if you step right over here by uh, Senator, you probably use that microphone there. Chairperson and, and members of the board. Um, my name is April Dunn. I'm the vice chair of the uh, Development of Disability Council, and I would like to say um, uh, please um, fix the MFP of uh, fix it and, and also fix the one for the uh, ch local share for the. Uh, Charter school for to to serve kids with disability. Thank you. 
Thank you. Let's see, with no other comments, uh, do we have anything else or can we get a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right, thank you all.